Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of the Jolly Heretic. Now, today I would like to talk about my erstwhile uh, boss, colleague, and friend, Professor Richard Lynn, who died on Monday, the 17th of July, uh, at the age of 93, uh, peacefully, uh, which is, of course, uh, very unfortunate. And uh, it is fair to say that I simply wouldn't be doing what I am doing today if it wasn't for him. I tweeted this out, and I didn't know that nobody else had done so, with the result that the tweet has been um, viewed numerous times, and most people have been have reacted very positively, in the sense, not positively that he's died, but possibly uh, to the huge contribution which he made to science. He discovered the Flynn effect, he discovered uh, all kinds of interesting things about IQ differences and so on. And uh, there are a few unpleasant haters saying things like they were left-wing people, obviously, because they're so compassionate, um, saying things like that they were glad he had died and so forth and that uh, he will be in hell. But all I can say to that is if heaven is where people like that are going, then I would rather be in hell because hell will be full of logical, reasonable, mentally stable uh, kind of people. So hell is probably a much better place to be than heaven in, in, uh, in their theology. Now, uh, so what I wanted to uh, talk about in this video really was uh, some of my memories of Richard. Um, I first uh, came across him really, well, without knowing it, in the it would have been the late mid to late 1990s, and I was uh, I was watching the Mikado uh, live uh, at some theatre in London, and there was a song called "I've Got a Little List." And they, the song made a reference to professors who were saying um, that the brain of one sex is smaller than the other. And that was a reference to Richard Lynn, who had been in the in the newspapers at the time for saying this. But I only really realised who he was when I, in the mid two thousands, when I was just looking through some books at Ola University Library and happened to find one of his books on group differences in intelligence. And slowly, I built up the confidence to start corresponding with him. Uh, and I started to realise that the environmental determinism with which I, doing a theology degree and a religious studies. Um, a doctorate have been have been inculcated was was clearly wrong, and it was particularly wrong in relation to religion and in relation to differences between ethnic groups, which was what I had been uh, looking at at the time. He was always extremely polite. He would always reply. You get some celebrity academics or whatever who think that they're, they're, they're too good to reply. They, they'll say that oh, I get so many emails, I can't possibly reply. All this not that they'll they'll they won't put their email on the website. They'll put one of those annoying forms that you put in, you know, so they can basically just an excuse to make it look like they, they want to correspond with people, but of course they don't. Uh, Richard Lynn wasn't like that at all. He, he, um, he, he would always reply and so forth, and we got to know each other corresponding. And then eventually, in, in what well, it must have been 2011, um, he, he started, I, he started uh, giving me a little bit of funding to do various bits of work here and there. And then in 2012, he offered me funding to research uh, the relationship between a book on the relationship between religiosity and intelligence. And this completely changed everything. I, I can't see how I, if that hadn't happened. Maybe there would be some other means by which I'd have got into based science. But but uh, that was definitely the turning point in, in age of about 31. That I went from being a, a, a journalist and uh, and doing sort of cultural anthropology and things to to doing based science um, and. Then after that, we st uh, well, we met then, we first met in Bristol. He invited me to come to Bristol. I happened to be in England for Christmas, and he invited me to come to, to, to Bristol to see him in, it must, was it in the, right at the beginning of the new year of 2013, um, or was it, I think it might have been just at the end of 2012. And he picked, he picked me up, he was 80, what was he, he'd been 81 years old, and I was very nervous, and I got to the car park at the railway station in Bristol, and I was looking for him, like, where is he, where is he? And then eventually there was this very, it, it, just just in the distance, I saw this very short, uh, hunched over elderly man with bright white hair sort of waving something at me because he, he, he realising it was me, he found a picture of me from somewhere, I suppose. And so I went, I went to some little Ford Fiesta or whatever he was driving, some little car. And so first of all, he, he, drove, he drove me over to Bristol's oldest pub, which was medieval, and we, and we had a look around that. And uh, then he took me to some to some large church in Bristol, where I, I, I sort of nearest thing they have to a cathedral in Bristol, I suppose, where William Chatterton was buried and and, and this sort of thing, and that was very interesting. Uh, and took me around some park, and then he took me for a very nice, uh, very nice lunch. 
I remember I had pasta with duck, Italian restaurant, uh, pasta with duck and so forth. And then he drove me around a bit more and then commented on how he's very, very elderly and, and, and very tired. And he sort of conks out in the middle of the day. And so if, if, um, if I didn't, if, if, if you don't mind, if, 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 if you don't mind, um, uh, perhaps I could uh, drop you off at the railway station now, which he did many hours earlier than my train. And it's a long way from London to Bristol. It's about three hours. So and he gave me a book which he'd found on religion or something like this, and said, "Hey, we'll take that. We've, uh, we've got we've got we've got plenty to read." So and then and then and then off he went. And then after that, uh, we did various uh, for the next year. We did various papers together, uh, and the, the book that resulted was religion. Here we go: religion, intelligence, and evolutionary analysis. And then the following year, he said, well, what about next year? What do you want to do next year? I'd rather like you to do a book on the relationship between race and sport. So that was then that was then 2012 or 2013 into 2014, this book, um, which uh, which was well, it was it did well enough that, it, that it's been translated into Russian. So, um, so that was that was that was that year, and then we wrote various articles together on that issue, on race and sport, and we'd done other things on the Flynn effect and and various other topics. Uh, and then the follow in 2014, he invited me to the first ever London conference on intelligence, and I hadn't seen him since the end of 2012. Um, we'd spoken on the phone a bit and whatever, but I hadn't I corresponded on email, but I hadn't actually seen him. And by then it was getting interesting. I mean, I was published in Intelligence, which was this major journal and which people actually cite. So to go from being a cultural anthropologist to publishing in a major journal, you know, a journal people actually cite, it's actually interesting, um, was, was quite a significant thing. And I, in the meantime, I'd, got, I'd been corresponding with a few people such, who, were, who he put me in touch with, such as, such as Michael Woodley. And then I got to the conference, which was at this London Gentleman's Club. And um, it was like the first day at school or like being a new boy, I guess, at the first day at school, because I didn't know anybody. And, but everybody seemed to know everybody else. Uh, and, I, and I went in and Richard, Ed, Ed, and he was sitting with, sitting with uh, Kenya, Kenya Kura, who is a, a Japanese uh, researcher who's done research with me on um, on the uh, intelligence and personality among among Japanese and genius among uh, among Japanese people and 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 then and so and then gradually through him I got to know all these other people and it and it, and it just um, and then you start having a great deal in common with them and you realize that you're all in it together there's the, the, these sorts of thick as thieves based researchers who are who are who are, who are fighting against insanity and wokeness and um and that was what he helped facilitate that was what he helped to to bring about and i carried on writing articles with him and papers with him and the next year he had this idea that i should do something on extending j philippe rushton's rk model which became this eventually j philippe rushton a life history perspective there you are i remember him um telling me speaking of death that he was rather upset that j philippe rushton was his best friend and was the best man at his wedding, at his third wedding, uh, Richard. And J. Philip Russian hadn't told him he, he was that he was dying or anything. And he said, oh, you're meant to be your best friend. He doesn't even tell you this. You know, he was a little bit hurt by that. Uh, and so that was that project. And then it just carried on. And we had further London. Always uh, Richard would continue working. I mean, by this time now, we're talking in his, in his mid 80s. Uh, no, no intention of of, of spending his retirement going as far as the local pretty town, little quaint town, and having a cup of tea and coming home. He would spend, um, to a certain extent, a sort of a half working day at his computer doing his research, even right up to in his 90s. Um, and certainly at that stage, and it would be doing papers with me, doing papers with other people. Um, that was the kind of work ethic that he that he, that he had. Uh, and he was always so incredibly polite and so incredibly helpful and so incredibly willing to try and you know, help people out and to try to find, I suppose he saw me as a kind of protege and there were other protégés that he saw as well. And uh, with the, um, a funding to which he had access, he would always do what he could to try and ensure that it's difficult to get funding for this kind of research. But uh, he would always do everything he could to to assist. It was uh, it was quite extraordinary. What what a what a you know, considering he's this evil scientific racist. What a what a kind, uh, polite, uh, reasonable, and uh, hard working man he was. And the next project then he wanted me to do something on was ethnocentrism, which became this book. And then the next one. 
was um, an idea that myself and Michael had, which was on something on the decline and fall of intelligence. Now, of course, he had, he had written a book on this uh, called Dysgenics. But one of the things that Richard did, and I guess it was because of the generation he was, I mean, remember, he was born in 1930. He got his doctorate in 1956. Um, he would write in this incredibly formal scientific style incredibly dry, which is weird because when you read his memoirs, they are extraordinarily well written. I mean, most of it is anyway. It's like it's like reading a novel. I mean, it's incredibly well written stuff. So he was obviously a brilliant writer, but he had been taught that when it comes to science, that you must write in this very dry style. No personal anecdotes, um, no illustrations from real life, nothing like that. Those things must be kept separate. Um, uh, so he did not write popular science books. And myself and Michael had this idea that, no, this should be a popular science book and it should be presented in such a way that it draws in the average layman, that it's, in, that it's, that it's, that it's interesting, that it makes them think about everyday life and so on, that there's anecdotes, that there's jokes. Uh, and, and that's, of course, exactly what we did. And that's what differentiated it from dysgenics. <clears throat> Um, and so, uh, and, and so, and, and he understood that, and, and the importance of that, and so he, he funded the writing of, of that book as well. Um, and and it just it it always like this. He would always or almost always come to the London Conference on Intelligence. He would often stand to do his speeches, even though he needed a stick to walk, and he was becoming increasingly hunched over. And he would always do these incredibly coherent and polite speeches, and then he would always often at his own expense uh, take people out, take take all of us out for for meals. And, uh, and, and things like this to, 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 ce to celebrate the conference and so forth. He was an incredibly generous and kind man. Obviously, he was an elderly man, and uh, certain things kind of happen to the mind as one gets older, um, uh, which are unfortunate. And I'm afraid those things uh, did rather happen to him. Uh, with with certain consequences, um, certain uh, papers that he accidentally published twice and therefore needed to be withdrawn, or uh, as the person that was in charge of a particular project with me, um, <clears throat> being most insistent um, that a, a certain master's thesis did not need to be cited because it contained the military data and the military data was surely open to everybody and so therefore it wasn't cited and therefore we got done for plagiarism. Um, um, or what else? Um, well, in this, in his memoirs, you can see that it's all very well written. And I suspect he wrote almost all of this up to the age of about 82, 83. And then towards the end, it, it stops being well written. It basically just becomes a series of a series of diary entries uh, that, that, uh, that, that aren't very well done, aren't, aren't very well done at all. And obviously he wasn't aware this was happening to him. Uh, uh, or he was aware. He once said to me when, when he, he asked me for a, a copy of a paper. And I um and, and uh, the, the I'd written. I, I said, well, I wrote this with you. Don't you know that you were the co-author on this paper? He said, oh God, yes, so I am. Oh God, my mind must be going as I get older. So he was kind of aware of it. And it was, I mean, for things like um, there was a paper that he published uh, in personality visual differences on uh, group differences in penis size, and um, the data was fake. I mean, the data was fake, uh, but being a very elderly man and being naive and it not occurring to him that anyone would do something so egregious, um, he found the data, wrote the paper, it was published in, in personality individual differences, and of course the data was fake. And, he, and, he, and even the reviewers, I don't remember that the reviewers were his kind of age as well, didn't, didn't understand this, and it was published. Um, so there were, there were things like that towards the end. I mean, there is a level on which when you're that elderly, maybe it's a good idea if you kind of retire at... Uh, retire from writing at about 80 uh, and, and um, spend time playing bridge, which he, which he loved doing, or spend time with your grandchildren or, or your wife or whatever it happens to be. But on the other, on the other hand, um, that's not him. That wasn't him. He, he was absolutely motivated by discovering the truth, by discovering the nature of the world in more detail, by collecting uh, a group of differences in IQ, by all of these things that he wanted to do. And that was what that was. That was his absolute passion. That was what he wanted to do. And he saw retirement, as he told me, he saw retirement as a means to be able to do that. Because because you had certain restrictions when he was still working at the University of Ulster, he founded the psychology department at the University of Ulster in the early seventies, and that department, by the way, in in the wake of the London Conference on Intelligence for all, cancelled. I mean, very cowardly, cancelled his MRI as professorship. He there would be no such department. It wasn't. It wouldn't exist. 
um, but they, but but they rather uh, rather spinelessly, uh, or, or in order to virtue signal that that's what the, the pathetic uh, department at the University of Ulster did. But of course, he didn't care, uh, and, and and his retirement just allowed him to just pursue whatever interests he academic interests he wanted to, which he did, as far as I can know, right up to the end. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if there are a number of unpublished papers. I mean, the last the last book that he was involved in, I think I've got a copy of it here, was a fight shift to Helmut Nyborg, who, by the way, is himself 86, and and you wouldn't know it. And Richard was the editor of this, and this was published. This was published in late May, uh, I think it was, or even early June, late May. And uh, Richard, of course, is, was um, by then was seriously ill. Um, and I'm anyway. I just I'm very glad to have known him. Um, a lot of us would think that our our research interests, our our, the, our our research, the stuff that we've done, would not be what it was. If it wasn't for Richard Lynn. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of uh, of Richard Lynn. Even the Flynn effect, we'll call it the Flynn effect, but it wasn't actually James Flynn that discovered the Flynn effect, i.e., the, the the temporal rise in IQ scores across time in Western countries. It was Richard Lynn. Um, but but for some reason Charles Murray. Uh, uh, Flynn was the one that wrote a really big paper on it, and Charles Murray christened the Flynn effect, but it wasn't Charles Murray, it wasn't Flynn that discovered it, it was Lynn. Uh, but Lynn, of course, so modest and, 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 and so forth, he didn't seem to mind. But some people call it the Flynn, Lynn, the Lynn Flynn effect or whatever for this reason. It was Lynn, it was Lynn that published on this first. Um, and on many other things. So obviously we're all um, tremendously sad that he's that he's gone. But um, and but but no matter what the enemies of science, the the I love scientists think, um, his legacy is going to live on. And uh, everyday experience um, is of course consistent with his theories, uh, which he so fearlessly pursued, uh, rather than their theories. So I would just say. Uh, rest in peace, Professor Richard Lynn. We're not going to see your luck again, I'm afraid.